All right, everyone, if you found this room, you found the Humanists of Houston. We're a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to promoting the principles of secular humanism. So I, I see a lot of familiar faces out there, so I'm glad everyone found the spot. As you know, our advertised talk for this afternoon is going to be from Dr. Keith Parsons about the Castle Bravo nuclear tests, and we'll be having him a bit later. But before that, we're going to have a few announcements, and we are going to show a, a first topic video. Well, I'd like to say thank you to Vic for finding that. That was seasonal and, you know, a good idea. So I have to admit, I didn't even have my eye on anything for Christmas, so Vic gets all the credit for finding that video. Yeah, that was very good. Yeah. I, uh, I realized that earlier, I don't think I introduced myself properly, so I'll just mention that I'm Julie Eversoll, and I'm the outgoing president of the Humanists of Houston for 2014. And so our next order of business today needs to be to elect a slate of officers to carry us forward for 2015. So I believe Sheila Finch is the keeper of all of the nominations for that, so can I invite she would have come up. And yeah. <laughs> keep, keep, keep us legal, Sheila, run the, run the election. Uh, stay there one second, Judy, because oh, I have something to give you. Uh, we have a very small presentation for Judy to say thank you very, very much for you being our president this year and for providing such good programs. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Judy is also on our slate because she's going to be our volunteer um, representative. Ah, uh, yes, volunteer coordinator. Mm -hmm. Volunteer coordinator, right. And then otherwise... Um, yeah, sure, no um, okay. Good morning. Our, our slate is um, for the president, uh, Vic Wang, yes. that many of us know already. Oh. Yeah, Vic, would you just stand up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, vice president is Ms. Galindo, who's... Uh, First name I need is it Hello, right? Nice Hello. to meet you. Angela. Angela, thank you. Angela Galindo for Vice President. Um, our secretary is uh, Bob Gross, and he's over there. Our treasurer is in Big Bend Park. <laughs> <laughs> and then Judith, the volunteer coordinator. So that's the statement we have. If, if, unless there are, are there any other um, nominations from the floor? We need to if you're willing to vote on the slate, those in favor, please raise your hands. And if anyone against? <laughs> Our well, new volunteers, you. yes. <laughs> well, happy solstice, everybody. And, uh, solstice on the 20th this year. It's on the 20th, thank you. All right, thank you, Sheila. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sheila. Yeah, I mean, like the brown. All right, Vic has some announcements. Yeah. Well, yeah, hey everybody, it's so great to be back. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Great to see all of you all here. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for having me back. And, uh, you know, when I first joined up with uh, the uh, HOH officer team uh, a few years back, um, it was after I just only come to a couple um, of actual events by HOH and uh, Roxy invited me to join as an officer and I came in on board and um, I was a little apprehensive because of the fact that you know I didn't really know a whole lot of, the, a whole lot of y'all yet and I didn't really feel like I had the credentials to take uh, the VP position at the time but um, I was very pleasantly surprised just to see how much I was very much welcomed by the group. And, yes, you're um, very missed. <laughs> and then that's, well thank you, thanks Jim, that's the other thing, uh, you know, I've been away for a while now um, but uh, uh, hopefully, you know, uh, I'm welcoming back again uh, second time around. So uh, I did want to say that uh, we, I didn't really want to get too ahead of myself before this was official, but we have been working behind the scenes to already get prepared for next year, coming up with great ideas uh, of things we can do to improve the organization. And we've also been working on bringing in uh, guest speakers, which we've already uh, scheduled for January. We're going to have Zach Coplin. Gonna, who's been a great guest speaker of ours oh. in the past. In fact, he was, uh, this was the place he did his very first speaking engagement. Uh, Zach, for those who are not familiar with him, back when he was uh, in high school, he became a secular activist for the advocacy of science education uh, in public schools. And uh, he's only a few years out of high school and he's still doing that full time. He's made national TV appearances on uh, national, you know, TV shows uh, nationwide. Um, and he's still uh, focused on, on trying to keep science, good science, in the public school system. So we just recently had uh, 
some controversial results from the textbook hearings for Texas <laughs> textbooks, where some of the content that got approved was um, pretty. Yeah, it was <laughs> some pretty religious content that got that got snuck into the textbooks. Um, so he's going to talk about that. He actually uh, he was actually uh, there in Austin testifying before the school board about that. Um, and as you probably got the notifications too, in um, on D December twentieth. We're going to have our solstice party, which we've been able to uh, get a private performance from Quiet Company, um, which was the music you heard when you were coming in uh, today. Uh, Quiet Company was actually the uh, headliners, the American Atheist National Convention, uh -huh. and they were uh, the South by Southwest 2014 Rock Band of the Year, uh, Austin Chronicle Band of the Year. I mean, they've racked up so many awards. Basically, they used to be a, uh, well, they they don't like to use the term Christian band, but essentially they were a Christian band until the lead singer became an atheist and then uh, <laughs> they released an entire album about uh, atheist songs, uh, some of which uh, I played while you were coming in. Um, and uh, yeah, I've seen them in concert now four times and they're really, really great live especially. And so, um, yeah, so that will be December 20th uh, at the Fox and the Hound. Um, got a private room and everything, so, uh, and in previous years we actually have uh, had about uh, two to three hundred people come to the Solstice parties, so um, we have a good turnout again. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, that's all the, yeah, just next week. Well, there, there's a few more things that are not quite ready yeah. to announce. There's still a few other things in the works that are not quite ready to, uh, but yeah, you'll be getting announcements on that shortly. In the holiday season, the most important thing is that everybody knows when the parties are. Next Saturday, the 20th, <laughs> concert coming up. And you might want to keep the Saturday after Christmas open. That's <laughs> not official, but the all evening right, of Saturday you. after Christmas. Okay. So, all right, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ed. Thank all right, at last for the main event. Our speaker for today has graciously agreed to come all the way up from the Clear Lake area, so thank you and your wife for making a you know, several hour commitment on, an, on a lovely Saturday when I know I, I was probably going to be raking leaves. <laughs> football season ended last week. Uh, uh, that's so. right, yeah, it's not that's too big of a burden on college. All right, so to give a proper introduction, nuclear tests were carried out in the Marshall Islands in the 1950s. The focus of our speaker's forthcoming book will be on the biggest of those tests, the Kessel Bravo event of March 1st, 1954. This was a 15 megaton blast that irradiated neighboring islands and a Japanese fishing boat and caused an international outcry. The story is particularly poignant because the native inhabitants of Bikini Atoll have not been able to return nearly 60 years after the tests. So Keith M. Parsons is a professor of philosophy at the University of Houston Clear Lake a recent winner of the President's Distinguished Research Award. He's spoken previously for us at HOH, and he's written for the National Center for Science Education, and has numerous books and articles on religion, atheism, and the history and philosophy of science. His most recent book is It Started with Copernicus, which is just out this past August, and some other titles include Drawing Out Leviathan, Dinosaurs and the Culture Wars, and God and the Burden of Proof. Welcome, Mr. Parsons. Uh, probably wondering what is a philosopher doing concerned with nuclear weapons? Huh? Yeah. Well, uh, basically, I've been personally fascinated by them ever since I was a small kid. I'm 62, almost exactly the same age as the hydrogen bomb. The first hydrogen bomb went off November 1st, 1952, when I was exactly two months old. So, you're, you know, we're both at the retirement age now. I'm not retiring, and apparently, the hydrogen bomb isn't either. So, unfortunately, but uh, yeah. So my fascination goes way back. I can still remember how in grade school, I'm sure some of you guys that are approximately my age can remember too, how we used to have duck and cover drills, right? Okay, is that every so often, the school would mandate that we jump out of our desks on signal and that we jump under our desk and we bend over and put our heads between our legs and as the stale joke went, kiss your butt goodbye, of course. You know, as if a school desk could protect you from a you know, multi-megaton blast, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those of us of approximately my age sort of grew up with uh, thermonuclear weapons in the background the whole time. You know, they were sort of always there. Uh, my academic training, I uh, took my PhD in history and philosophy of science uh, at the University of Pittsburgh and they told us you can't just be a philosopher, you have to be a historian too. And so, 
basically I write one book on philosophy, then the next book is history of science. And so, you know, this is, uh, this is what I'm really interested in. I'm not a physicist, by the way. I'm a historian and a philosopher. I'm co-writing this with uh, Dr. Robert Zabaya, who is a nuclear physicist, and he's the one who's doing so. I'm sure those of you here with physics training know more about the details of the physics than I do. So, you know, if you ask me an extremely detailed question about the physics, I might have to defer to someone with greater expertise in here. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, I could answer it as best I could, but I might have to defer to someone else, uh, you know. So, um, is there a physicist in the house? Uh, I have to ask that right now. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks. I'm calling upon you. All right. So, uh, uh, you know, that's the, uh, that's the situation. Okay. What I would like to do, first of all, is uh, just show a clip from... One of my favorite videos, which I watch every few weeks, okay, called Trinity and Beyond. It's truly for nuclear weapons junkies. It even has 3D glasses, <laughs> so you can watch the glass in 3D, okay? Uh, you know, yeah. Hey Keith, are you familiar with a woman named Helen Caldicott? Called what? Are you familiar with a woman named Helen Caldicott? Oh yeah, sure I am. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I saw uh, her uh, presentation back, I think, in the 1980s, uh, as, uh, you know, the, the fear of nuclear war really resurfaced again in the 1980s, you know, during, you know, the uh, Reagan administration. And, uh, you know, you had, uh, that guy, what's his name, Jonathan Shell wrote in The New Yorker, The Fate of the Earth, you know, about what nuclear war would be like. Um, let's sum up his book. It would be bad. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> in uh, various ways. But anyway, I would like to show you uh, just a very brief clip from this, uh, this, this film, which is about the Castle Bravo test itself. The reason I wanted to show this is that there's nothing like the actual visceral visual impact of seeing a 15 megaton blast. What you will see is a fireball that uh, becomes four miles in diameter in less than a second. Okay dug out a crater 300 feet deep and more than a mile in diameter, that sort of thing, uh, with an, uh, a mushroom cloud that shot up uh, to 114,000 feet, okay, and uh, basically produced a flash that was so bright it was seen in Okinawa from the Marshall Islands. That's like an explosion in Boston that was seen in Bogota, Colombia, okay, if you want to give some idea. Uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the brilliance of the flash uh, there, that's right, yeah. So, uh, that's it. anyway, uh, so let's just hit that right now. Hit the light? Which one hit the light? Arms had progressed from Operation Ivy, culminating in the spring of 1954 with Castle Bravo, the largest device ever detonated in atmospheric testing by the United States. Bravo was a hydrogen bomb using solid thermonuclear fuel, confirming the designs of Edward Teller and Stan Newman, paving the way to producing aircraft deliverable hydrogen bombs and more effective weapons. the atmospheric effects. That's the heat hitting the ball through his hair. That's the 
shockwave coming across the ocean. Shockwave hits the island. Uh, the sum total of megatonnage reduced, uh, released, yielded by these tests is 108 megatons, okay, 108 megatons, released in the Marshall Islands, okay. Uh, the total land area of Bikini, for instance, is only two square miles, so 108 megatons on these tiny coral atolls. This was the equivalent of one Hiroshima bomb every day for 19 years. Comment, question? Yeah, where exactly are the Marshall Islands? Okay, Marshall Islands are located in the northern tropics uh, of about 11 degrees. Bikini is about 11 degrees uh, north latitude and uh, exactly almost the same longitude as New Zealand, okay? So imagine a map of the Pacific. Uh, you go to Hawaii, you continue to go west and a bit south, okay, and you want right with the mark. Why the Marshall Islands? Well, weather's nice. Not like having to set off tests in the Antarctic or something like that. Okay, weather's nice, shirt sleeve weather year round. Okay, uh, it was under U.S. control after the United States basically defeated Japan and kicked them off of the Marshall Islands. Uh, we took over and put it under military control. All right. Uh, it had uh, few built-up structures, and best of all. It was lightly populated. Lightly populated does not mean unpopulated. There were, in fact, on Bikini Atoll, uh, 167 inconvenient persons that had to be removed. Well, this was a rather delicate operation. So they had uh, this uh, U.S. military uh, governor there in 1946 approach these 167 people and persuaded them very eloquently to let the United States briefly and temporarily make use of their home, okay? Uh, the Navy filmed this, filmed this encounter. Uh, Commander Wyatt was his name, he spoke very eloquently, he used biblical metaphors comparing the natives uh, of Bikini to the children of Israel who had to wander in the desert for 40 years. Uh, there's a slight difference there. Moses supposedly released the children of Israel from bondage. Uh, we were evicting the people from their ancestral home where they and their ancestors had lived uh, for thousand years. 
and we were just going to use their island for peaceful purposes, we said, to turn this terrible thing into a force for good. We then proceeded to bomb the hell out of it, okay? Turning it into the most radiologically polluted place on Earth, okay? Bikini is still not inhabited to this day, okay? It is still uninhabited. The nuclear tests began with Operation Crossroads in 1946 and continued through 1958, okay? Uh, <clears throat> during um, the year 1954 alone, nearly 50 megatons uh, of uh, nuclear yield was exploded just on Bikini and the surrounding areas. Of course, it got to the point where, as I say, there wasn't enough land to support the explosions, so they started towing barges out there and putting barges over the craters where the previous bombs had been. Uh, so otherwise, there would have been no land left at all, okay, nothing left at all, uh, this sort of thing. Okay, so uh, the natives of Bikini were moved out. There's a very touching scene in which the king, King Judah, is the local chief there, stood up and responded that it is in God's hands, which of course is what always must be said by small people when facing the immensely powerful. There was a wonderful cartoon in the New Yorker that captured the spirit of the time. The New Yorker showed a sea full of battleships and aircraft carriers and a huge landing ship that was disgorging supplies on this tiny island. There was a tiny knot of indigenous people. One of them comes forward and says, we have voted for you not to conduct nuclear tests in this area. <laughs> okay, all right, you know, so anyway, uh, it was in God's hands and they were moved off and they haven't returned yet, okay. So, of the series of tests uh, that were done there, uh, the most dramatic and uh, the most dangerous was the Castle series of tests. The Castle tests were designed specifically to uh, develop a deliverable thermonuclear weapon, okay? And as I'm sure most of you know, uh, a thermonuclear weapon is an entirely different thing from a mere atomic bomb. A mere atomic bomb is a single stage device which uses lensed high explosive to create a concentric shock wave which then implodes plutonium, okay, implodes plutonium very rapidly. There is an initiator that emits neutrons inside the plutonium which then once it is properly compressed, the initiator then releases neutrons releasing a super fast in microseconds chain reaction. Uh, the plutonium becomes what they call supercritical and uh, there, it goes through 80 generations of uh, 80 generations of, uh, of, uh, of fission at that point with each generation increasing the energy released uh, at an exponential rate. Okay, The fission bomb releases uh, yields of mere kilotons, thousands of tons of TNT, a conventional explosive. Uh, the Fat Man uh, fission bomb that was uh, dropped on Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945, released approximately 21 kilotons, okay? Thermonuclear weapons are two-stage devices. The uh, <coughs> fission bomb, the atomic bomb, is simply the fuse that sets it off, okay? Simply the fuse that sets it off. It's the first stage. Uh, the first stage of the fission bomb then, by a process known as uh, radiation implosion, compresses the fusion fuel. The fusion fuel, in the case of uh, <clears throat> Castle Bravo, was lithium deuteride. Lithium in a, a compound of the metal lithium with uh, deuterium, okay, isotope of hydrogen. Lithium deuteride was the fusion fuel. It compresses the fusion fuel by a process known as radiation implosion, which essentially you use x-rays generated by the fission device. The x-rays uh, compress and heat the uh, <coughs> fusion fuel, which then ignites, producing a massive explosion. Okay, explosion. It releases further neutrons, which then causes further fusion. Fission causes fusion, causes more fission, causes more fusion in a feedback, a hideous feedback uh, reaction that reduces an explosion of quite literally unlimited power. Um, there are theoretical or 
actually engineering limits to how powerful you can make a fission bomb, an atomic bomb, there is no limit to the power of a thermonuclear bomb. It just depends upon how much fuel you want to put in. The, the Russians, of course, in 1962, excuse me, 1961, decided to do us one better, and they created a monster bomb, okay? Khrushchev told Andrei Sakharov, let's show the bastards what we can do, the bastards being us, of course. Okay, let's show the bastards what we can do. I want you to make a 100 megaton bomb. A 100 megaton bomb, of course, is so big it's useless. What would you use it on? There's not no target big enough to justify. Besides, it would have been so dangerous that if it had been exploded anywhere, even in the vastness of Russia, it would have dropped uh, you know, radioactivity back on Russia. So they reduced it to 50, only 50 megatons, okay? Which was, of course, that's the largest explosion ever by human beings, okay? So the Russians, you know, outdid us on that. But it was decided to uh, test various designs uh, for a thermonuclear bomb, and so they went to Bikini, which was conveniently then, uh, had been, uh, the people had been removed. Unfortunately, there were still people within a 200 mile radius, okay? And there had only been one previous thermonuclear test. This was Ivy Mike, which took place two months after I was born in November 1952. Ivy Mike was not a deliverable bomb. Ivy Mike uh, used liquid deuterium, which has to be kept at near absolute zero. And to all the cryogenic equipment mean, meant that they had to build a device that was like 82 tons and three stories tall. Uh, it was not a deliverable bomb. Uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer commented that the only way you could deliver it would be like by ox cart into Moscow, and surely the people in Red Square would notice as you were putting the thing up. You know? <laughs> Somebody would say, what the hell is that? Okay, all right, you know, so uh, <clears throat> that sort of thing. So to have a deliverable bomb, they used a dry bomb using lithium deuteride as a fuel, okay, down to only 12 tons, all right? So on March the 1st, 1954, uh, at 6.45 in the morning, Castle Bravo was detonated. It had been predicted to have a yield between four and eight, mega, only four and eight megatons, instead it ran away to 15 megatons, 150% greater than the prediction, okay? The effects of Castle Bravo uh, were stunning, overwhelming, terrifying. Cataclysmic, apocalyptic. Let's see, where's my thesaurus? I'm going to use there, but you know, that basically uh, just got, let me read a little bit from the draft of my book about the explosion of Castle Bravo, just to give you, hope you don't mind if I read a tad in here. This also, of course, is free advertising for my book. <laughs> shrimp, shrimp was the name of the device, by the way. It was the one you saw there. They called it Shrimp, I guess because it was smaller than the previous one. Shrimp was detonated at 6.45 a.m. on March the 1st, 1954. Observers aboard the Curtis at sea, 23 miles from ground zero, had been instructed to put on dark goggles. Even then, the light from Bravo was so intense that they could see the bones in their arms as with an x-ray image. This was the flash that made Oishi Matasichi. Oishi Matasichi was a, was, a, was a fisherman on board the Lucky Dragon No. 5, which was a Japanese fishing vessel, which was 75 miles from Bikini at that time. He saw it, it made him jump out of his uh, bunk at uh, 6.45 in the morning. Uh, <clears throat> the light was visible for over a minute on Rongerich uh, Atoll, 150 miles east of Bikini. The atmospheric reflection of the, map of the blast was seen as far away as Okinawa, as I said, 2,600 miles distant, like an explosion in Boston that could be seen in Bogota. The flash could have been seen from Mars at anybody in Washington. It's difficult to imagine the explosive force of 15 million megatons of TNT. Jonathan Weisskall notes that a freight train carrying that much TNT would span the United States from Maine to California. The explosion was nearly 40 times as powerful as the Russian layer cake design and was 1,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb that had killed 70,000 people in one day. Pause and think about that. Here was a device, here was a bomb that was 1,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima little boy uh, atomic bomb of uh, 15 uh, kilotons. And uh, <clears throat> that little bomb, little boy, killed 70,000 people in one day. So the capacity, the power of uh, the Castle Bravo device was um, genuinely apocalyptic. Okay, tremendous, 
uh, incredible explosion. All right, it was seen by um, people as a safe from great distances. One of the most remarkable sets of experiences. Uh, oh, by the way, let me say uh, uh, here that shrimp was not only an unusually big bomb, it was an unusually dirty one. That is one that produced a great deal of intensely radioactive fallout. The bomb was extra dirty because of the fission reactions in the natural uranium jacket. Natural uranium, which is mostly you know, 99.3% uranium-238, is natural uranium, and it does not undergo uh, chain reaction. Uh, uh, it's not a fissile material, but it's fissionable. Uh, or purpose there. And that means it can be set off by fast neutrons. The bomb was extra dirty because the fission products in the natural uranium jacket that surrounded the, uh, the fusion fuel stage, the fission products coated the coral fragments, blasted into the atmosphere, and so created the death ash that rained down on unsuspecting people. One of the most remarkable, harrowing sets of experiences was by the people who actually set off the bomb. Uh, the people who actually detonated Castle Bravo were located on another island in the atoll there, which was 20 miles away, and they ensconced themselves in a steel-reinforced concrete bunker with blast doors, with every protection that you would think that they could have. And of course, remember, they were expecting only six megatons, so they thought they were perfectly safe, okay? Uh, they soon began to realize otherwise. Let me read you a little bit about their experiences here. I'm just going to go on probably about another 10 minutes or so, then we'll stop. Well, you're, you're fine you on time. time. You're fine on time. Okay. You the most harrowing experiences of the participants in the test were those of the firing team located 20 miles away on Inu. Inu, another one of those small islands. They were sealed behind blast doors in a reinforced concrete bunker that had been covered with sand. With such protection of being located 20 miles from the test site, 20 miles from the test site, they thought that they would be quite safe during the test. They were wrong. The head of the firing team was Dr. John C. Clark, a physicist and a participant in numerous nuclear tests. He recorded his experiences of the Bravo shot in an article published in the Saturday Evening Post in July 1957. Looking at his controlled blockhouse on Inu from a helicopter, it certainly looks sturdy enough. This is from Dr. Carter. The structure had been sealed to withstand up to at least a five-foot tidal wave and built with reinforced concrete to resist the overpressure and underpressure effects of the blast. It certainly looked secure enough even to satisfy those who had argued that we would be safer if the firing were controlled from a greater distance. Procedures to secure the blockhouse were carefully followed. At minus one hour, we started our final preparation and goes through about all the things they had to do. It says, naturally, they expected to feel some effect effects of the explosion. After the sequence timer had been started, we all gathered in the control room for a final briefing. I requested that all who were not needed in the control room should stand in the hall. I told them that although we expected no difficulty, there would be a ground shock shortly after the bomb went off. This would be followed by the air shock wave, which at 20 miles distance would probably do no great damage. 20 miles away, still reinforced concrete. We're, you know, safe as in mother's arms, right? Okay. Enclosed in the blockhouse, the firing crew could not see the explosion, but alarming effects were soon felt. Inside our blockhouse, we still had no physical evidence that anything had happened, but we braced ourselves against a possible sharp ground shock. It came, but not as expected. Less than 20 seconds after zero, the entire building started slowly rocking in an indescribable way. I grabbed the side of the control panel for support. Some of the men just sat down on the floor. I had been in earthquakes before, but never anything like this. It lasted only a few seconds, but just as we were breathing easier, another shot hit us with the same undulating motion. Then a minute later came the air blast, first the overpressure, then the sucking out by the underpressure. The concrete building creaked, but stayed firm. Uh, this, when I first read this, this made what little hair I have left try very hard to stand up on my head, okay? I haven't got much, but it tried to stand up, okay? Another member of the group found the experience of the ground shock equally alarming. Something was wrong. Team member Greer spoke the first words as he reached out to steady himself at the work, workbench. Is this building moving or am I getting dizzy? He asked. My God, it is. It's moving. Greer reached for the bench to steady himself as I stood bewildered in the center of the room. The whole building was moving, definitely now, not shaking or shuddering as it would from the air shock wave that had not arrived yet, but with a slow perceptible rolling motion like a ship's roll. I began to feel a nausea akin to seasickness. 
I was completely unable to get it through my head that the building was moving. The building is made of concrete, I told myself. The walls are three feet thick, and it's 20 miles away. It's anchored like a rock on the island. The <coughs> shock waves can't be here yet, but it was moving. Okay, well, that was just the start of the scary stuff. After the earthquake stopped, they went outside to check and see what was happening. Uh, they didn't really expect anything else. They said they could see the mushroom cloud, you know, which was now, of course, well up, uh, you know, above the troposphere, well up into the stratosphere. They could see the mushroom cloud, and they said it was a magnificent sight. Someone had the good sense to bring along a dagger counter, which began to tick, and then it began ticking faster and louder. Then the tick went into a buzz, and the buzz went into a roar, and they started paying attention. They were getting fallout. They were not predicted to get fallout. They were due east of the explosion, it was not supposed to go east, okay? It was supposed to go to the north and the northeast, but not due east. But very quickly, they noticed that the amount of fallout was getting quite dangerous. They rushed back inside, slammed the blast doors, called for relief, and were told, we can't come get you yet, it's too dangerous, the fallout's <laughs> coming down too fast, you'll just have to sit tight. So they sat there in the dark, of course, with no air conditioning, since you, air conditioning would bring in radioactive particles from the outside. So they sat there getting hotter and more uncomfortable for six hours. Finally, they were told that the rescue helicopter was on the way. But you had to get outside, which had already been covered with a nice thick blanket of radioactive gunk, okay? And how do you do it? They had no protective gear. They took sheets off their beds, cut eye holes, so looking like Halloween trick-or-treaters. They covered themselves with the sheets, and with that as protection, they ran out and jumped in a jeep, ran down to the waiting helicopter, and took off. High-tech stuff, right? <laughs> well, later on the day, it occurred to people, gee, that radiation is moving to the east. What else is to the east? Due to the east, due east of Bikini, are, are inhabited islands with Marshallese people. Oh, duh, gee, I guess we better do something about that, okay? Uh, no uh, ships had been especially uh, appointed to act as rescue vehicles, okay? No ships had been especially appointed. But they did make a decision the next day to get destroyers to go as rapidly as possible to the islands of Rongelaf and Utrecht to see what was happening there and, if necessary, to evacuate the several hundred people on those islands. What was happening on those islands? Let's read an account, okay. This is from uh, the island of Rongelaf which is 105 miles east of Bikini on the day of the Bravo test. And this is a young girl who was 14 at the time of the test. I was 14 at the time and my sister was 12. That day our teacher had asked us, my sister and I and my two cousins, to cook rice for the other children. We saw the bright light and heard a sound. Boom, we were really scared. At the time, we had no idea what it was. Afternoon, something powdery fell from the sky. What could that be? Only later were we told that it was fallout. With uh, Rocco and several cousins, I went to the end of Rangalath Island to gather some sprouted coconuts. One cousin climbed the tree and got something in her eyes, so we set another one up. The same thing happened to her. Then we went home. Ours was in the main village of Rangalath. It was raining. We saw something on the leaves, something yellow. Our parents asked us, what's happened to your hair? It looked like we had rubbed soap powder in it. That night we couldn't sleep. Our, we could not sleep. Our skin itched so much. Our feet on our feet were burns, as if from hot water. Our hair fell out. We would look at each other and laugh. You're bald. You look like an old man. But really, we were frightened and sad. Okay. John Angin was an adult who was super serving as magistrate on Rangelaf at the time. This is what he witnessed. On the morning of the bomb, I was awake and drinking coffee. I thought I saw what happened to be the sunrise, what appeared to be the sunrise. But it was in the west. Sunrise in the west, something is wrong. It was truly beautiful with many colors, red, green, and yellow, and I was surprised. A little while later, the sun rose in the east. Then sometime later, something like smoke filled the entire sky, and shortly after that, a strong and warm wind, as if a typhoon had swept across Rangelab. And all the people heard the sound of the explosion. Some people began to cry with fright. Several hours later, the powder began to fall on Rangelab. 
We saw four planes fly overhead, and we thought perhaps the planes had dropped this powder which covered our island and stuck to our bodies. Uh, <clears> the <throat> same sort of thing happened to another group. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, Oishi and Matasichi, the uh, Japanese fisherman, and his boat, the Lucky Dragon No. 5. As I say, they were 75 miles to the east of Bikini. 6.45, uh, they see a bright light, don't know what it is, but you know, they see some umbrella-shaped uh, thing in the, the west, I said. That, of course, is the mushroom cloud. But they didn't think anything more about it. A couple of hours later, uh, this uh, powder starts to fall from the sky and ashes, um, kind of like, uh, you know, something uh, uh, you know, very strange. It looked like snow in the tropics, okay? Snow in the tropics. Uh, uh, Matasichi says that he picked up one and tasted it, okay? Put it in his mouth, crunched it up. Uh, they worked all day with this stuff coming in. What, of course, it was was pulverized coral that had been intensely irradiated, that had been blown up, okay, into the stratosphere where it was supposed to be safe, but it wasn't, and it came uh, down all of them, okay, 23 members of all of the crew of the Lucky Dragon, as well, of course, as the, you know, Marshallese people on the islands were uh, <coughs> with acute radiation sickness, uh, you know, and have had uh, health problems all in total this day, okay, uh, never truly recovered uh, from that. Okay, well, this was done. What was the official reaction? Uh, Louis Strauss, who was the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission at the time, um, he gave a, uh, <clears throat> he uh, basically met uh, the press and had a press conference, and he said, oh yeah, well, a couple of bad things happened. Uh, we had this fishing boat that was where it was not supposed to be. It must have been in the danger zone and should have been warned. They should have known they were in the wrong place. And he told privately, not in the press conference, but privately he told other people that he thought that they were really uh, a red spy ship. In other words, they were you know, commissioned by the Russians to come and spy on the test. Well, as for the Marshallese people from uh, Rongelap and the other islands, he said, oh, they're doing fine, you know, they're just messing a little hair, okay. Uh, in a few weeks, they'll be okay, ha, 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 okay. The official reaction was cover up, deny, downplay, all that sort of thing. Well, that's what happened 60 years ago. That's what, why was it done? It was done, my best, most profound historical analysis is it was done because, uh, excuse the wording, we were scared shitless. Okay, uh, the Russians were busy developing their own thermonuclear weapons. Uh, you know, and they were doing so very rapidly. In fact, they already exploded uh, one kind of thermonuclear device called a Sloika a layer cake design before we did. So uh, we had terrible fears that uh, these things were that you know we were gonna, the Russians were getting ahead of us, this sort of thing. And uh, with all the sacrifices that were being demanded of Americans, uh, you know, as we saw it. What happened to a few, a few people inhabiting some remote atolls? If they were inconvenienced, big deal. Okay. Well, that's what I'm writing about. The book should be coming out with Cambridge University Press. We'd like to call it uh, "Bombing Bikini." Is what we'd like. You don't, of course, get a choice over what you title the book. You know, that's decided by the publisher. We would like to title it uh, "Bombing Bikini." Uh, <clears throat> nuclear tests in the uh, Marshall Islands, okay, that sort of thing. Maybe with bikini in the title, people will think it's about a swimsuit. You know, I don't know. Okay, but anyway, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's it. Okay, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Your comments, your questions, your analysis, uh, what you think of all this, why it was done, was it by any stretch of the imagination justifiable? Um, yeah. Have you ever heard of a program called Hain? H-A-N-E? No, no, tell me about it. HAIN is the, not, an acronym for High Altitude Nuclear Explosion. Oh, yeah? They learned something about these uh, weapons from those tests. Namely, there was, a, there was a device exploded 75 miles over the Pacific, around the same area as Marshall, set, uh, and it fried all the electronics in the entire area. It was in the 60s that it was done. And it was an a electro electromagnetic pulse that was emanated from the blast. And it literally fried everything in that entire that's what, that's what I heard. That's what I heard. And, uh, you know, the uh, Russian monster bomb, also with a huge electromagnetic pulse, it knocked out uh, radio communications for several hours afterwards in that area, okay? And uh, so, yeah, I think actually the um, video of the test that you're talking about is uh, in uh, Trinity and Beyond. Very yeah. dramatic. Uh, I read know. an article about the Scientific American, and they showed pictures of the of the hydrogen blast. It was just a 
huge red ball of, of glow above the horizon. You could see it several thousand miles away. I mean, that's what was visible. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, as a, you know, people hundreds of miles away could uh, could could see it quite definitely. You know, and. Uh, even hundreds of miles away, they got uh, a tremendous blast. I mean, the people who were on the ship, the US, USS Curtis, that was, uh, you know, observing from 23 miles away, uh, they said they could see the shock wave coming across the sea and when it hit the Curtis, and the Curtis was not a small ship. It rocked it from side to side, and people had to grab hold of things to keep from being pitched overboard, okay? And it was a completely terrifying experience. You know, one of the Scientists watching one of the physicists, uh, Harold Agnew, talked about how the heat from these thermonuclear blasts, and the heat, even if they were 30 miles away, the heat was like sticking your head in an oven, and it just wouldn't shut off. It just kept getting hotter and hotter. Quite a, quite a terrifying thing, yeah. I heard. Well, that, that sounds like a really scary movie. <laughs> so, what kind of scary is now? Or, you know, like... What happened with all those tests and now these thermonuclears? What is this thing now? What is? Oh, what are the what are the kind of tests are they doing now? Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, I think all the tests now are, are supposed to be underground. Okay. The French, as I understood it, continued to test uh, had atmospheric tests until 1996. You know, and so uh, they continued mm -hmm. to do it. Uh, there was a Where? test ban <laughs> treaty, atmospheric <laughs> test ban treaty, signed in 1963. Okay, which uh, you know, said there would be no. Uh, nuclear tests uh, in the atmosphere, but the French ignored that. This is when you had, of course, the you know confrontations between the French and Greenpeace, and that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, they last had it in 1996. Where, uh, some of the underground tests were horrible. Where do you too. think the French were testing? Pardon me. Where do you think the French were testing? Uh, French Polynesia. Okay. okay. You know, so uh, that's it. Uh, uh, French Polynesia. That's uh, that's that's where they did it. Uh, when you say they. Planned all this and carried out. Who is they? Um, was the military all involved? Was the government involved? Who okayed all of that sort of thing going on? Shortly after World War II, uh, a civilian agency, the Atomic Energy Commission, was mm -hmm. basically founded. And they had the ultimate authority. Of course, this ticked off the military because, you know, the general said, you know, it should be ours. General Leslie Groves, who was the general in charge of the Manhattan Project in World War II, he, of course, and the other generals, they wanted to keep it. So the ultimate responsibility for planning and carrying out these tasks was uh, the Atomic Energy Commission. Atomic Energy Commission, I think, was uh, superseded, as I recall, in 1975 by the Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. Department of Energy now basically controls. Uh, yeah, I'll just go from right to left on my here. Okay, yeah. And then, uh, uh, go ahead. It just looks to me, or it seems to me, from what, what I've read about it, and what you've had to say, and what I know from about, because I'm a little older than you, uh, the acute case of stupidity, <laughs> uh, and the pressure to keep up with our supposed enemies uh, allowed us to make not one, but multiple sequential stupid mistakes. Right. Yeah? And a portion of the population paid for it very dearly, you still can't go back to Bikini Atoll, and probably never will. Its level of radioactivity, the last time I heard anything about it, uh, is such that going back there is you know, just a delayed suicide system. Yeah, other islands too, uh, the, the uh, inhabitants of Rongelap, uh, which is to the east of Bikini, they went back there in uh, 1957, but... Um, they decided to leave in the 1970s. The U.S. government would not do anything about it, and ultimately Greenpeace did help them to leave, and uh, they have not gone back since. Uh, yeah. What kind of weaponry are on missiles in silos today? Is it anything like what we've been learning from you? or? You know, I don't know. I just uh, heard the news just recently. Some of you probably know more about this than I do. Um, you know, the focus of my study is like 60 years ago. I just saw the news uh, just recently that there is all sorts of concern about the deterioration of uh, you know, nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, that's been known for quite some time. In fact, there was an episode of The Simpsons. Um, <laughs> I mean, people have seen it in which uh, you know, the evil sideshow Bob you know, gets a thermonuclear device and he tries to set it off. Unfortunately, it is a fizzle because it says in their expiration date, 1959. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, you have to either make new ones or, you know. Well, uh, any 
to have critical mass of plutonium or uh, uranium-234 or 235, uh, it, even if you don't have it, deteriorating all the time. You know, it's it's losing electrons and just spontaneously. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just it's falling apart because it's not a stable material. Mm -hmm. If you look on a uh, put it on a, on a periodic table, the damn stuff doesn't hold together. It's not supposed yeah. to. It falls yeah. apart. <laughs> Yeah, the problem of it, one of the problems though, is some of those half-lives tend to be very long, as I understand it, is a plutonium, I think, about 24,000 years half-life uh, yeah. that is there. But it, it, you know, it loses so. also its ability to, to be critical mass. And what, uh, you, what, know, you what, get a, a small enough amount of it left, yeah, you know, and it's going to uh, you know, make, uh, make it uh, less ineffective. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's the What that's fascinates the me is how little, I don't remember the numbers now because it's been years since I, I did, did the math on it, the amount of a number of atoms or the actual grams of matter that were totally destroyed. Oh you, yeah, you can oh. carry it around in your hand. Oh sure, sure. Yeah. Well, you know the basic formula and, and there, of course. Wiped out is, entire. Right. The basic formula, of course, is you know the famous Einstein formula e equals m c squared. Okay, so that every bit of matter contains a vast amount of uh, energy that can be released. I done the and, numbers on one gram. Pardon me. I did the numbers on one gram. And it is a energy number piece of paper about that long. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah for well, one gram. You know, the speed of light, of course, is tremendous, and you, it's the speed of light squared and, that you multiply, and that and, produces and uh, speed of light squared vast, in meters, vast um, amounts of uh, energy. Matter in grams, and the answer comes in ergs. And ergs. The reason is converted to. As many orders of magnitude more powerful than any chemical explosion is that uh, you know the uh, nuclear explosions release the strong force in the atom, which is by far mm -hmm. the strongest of the forces, and it releases the energy release there relates to the strong force that binds <coughs> everything together. When, and, when I first uh, saw the numbers, I just uh, oh the numbers yeah, are the, the numbers count. themselves are, are simply simply stupefying, simply yeah. overwhelming. I mean, and again, uh, you know, we can say things like 15 megatons. Yeah. Okay. Right. And I sometimes ask my classes when I'm talking about this, I say, how many tons of TNT would it take to blow us up in this room? <laughs> tons? <laughs> A little tiny bit, you know, uh, would, uh, would blow up everybody, you know, and blow up the entire building that we were in. How, you know, how much? Sort of thing. Uh, this, so, this building would probably take about 40 what, pounds. It would just be a very, very small amount of TNT that it would take to, you know, blow up a sizable building. And you start talking about a ton of TNT, and then you start talking about a thousand tons and a million tons. I mean, this is something, it's like astronomical distances. You talk about the distance in miles to Alpha Centauri, and there's a number that makes your brain just go <laughs> 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 the first over here. To yeah. tie that same issue into to, to his question, uh, the, the warheads on our missiles today are not intended to be planet killers that are intended to be weapons. So they're only maybe five to 50 times more powerful than what we used in Nagasaki. But again, mm -hmm. if you want to put that in perspective of a, a Walmart truck could hold 50 tons of dynamite. You've, you've seen those travel down the hallway. That's big enough to blow up this entire city block. Oh yeah. Um, so 50, to, 50 tons of dynamite is nowhere near 50 tons of TNT. Excuse me, four. Got a woman here, you guys. Yes. Uh, I was asking each group if a guy uh, lost his cell phone and uh, he said he last had it in the restroom, in the men's restroom. Have anyone seen a black iPhone? No one? Well, we, we, whichever you prefer. A, a, a truck can easily carry 50 tons of something, and we're going to talk about a kiloton. Yeah to have a thousand tons, there's 20 truckloads. And a megaton, now there's 20,000 truckloads. Yeah. Uh, oh. Okay, yeah. now I'm starting to like get a visual yeah. <laughs> there that I can relate to. Yeah, it's a communication need. How do you explain something to people that they don't encounter in their everyday lives? Because yeah, I struggle with trying to process what can I compare it to that will make it meaningful. I mean, as a philosopher, you know, I'm interested in epistemology, you know, and how we know things and the, the way that uh, we do become, come to know uh, certain truths. And there are certain things that the numbers can tell you, and other things, I think, maybe knowledge even at a visceral level, 
but it's hard for the numbers to tell you. I mean, it always struck me how at the Trinity test on uh, July 16, 1945, which they set off the first nuclear explosion ever, of course, you had the most brilliant people in the world, you know, uh, such as, you know, Fermi and Oppenheimer and others working on this device, and so they had the numbers. But until it actually went off at 529 in the morning, until they could actually see that light brighter than a thousand suns, uh, they didn't really realize what they had done, you know. Uh, well, Oppenheimer, of course, famously said, yeah. quoted from the Bhagavad Gita, I am become deaf, the destroyer of worlds, okay. Ken Bainbridge, uh, who was another physicist, had a more earthy reaction. He says, we're all sons of bitches now, okay. <laughs> and uh, when you see that, you know, sort of thing, and someone said, my God, are we going to drop this on human beings? And General Crow said, yeah, <laughs> you well, bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, well, I was going to say, I learned recently about uh, a series of tests called Operation Plowshare, where they were using atomic bombs for civil engineering projects like above ground detonations to uh, create an artificial base and below ground detonations to enhance oil production. And it, that just sounds like, I mean, yeah. I can't what comprehend. Yeah, on. yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Why wouldn't they, they have thought, even at the time, this is madness? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, um, Edward Teller, uh, who was, of course, the so-called father of the atomic bomb, it was the teller ulam design, two-stage design with radiation implosion that really made uh, thermonuclear designs possible. Okay, Edward Teller, who uh, was not only he was sort of like a Doctor Strangelove figure in many ways. Okay, I think he was sort of the the, the paradigm upon which Stanley Kubrick based it. Uh, you know. uh, uh, he said, yeah, we can use it. You want a new Panama Canal? I can dig it instantly. You don't have yeah. to send down a bunch of dirt diggers and stuff like that. I can create you a new Panama Canal in two seconds. Well, they, they, <laughs> they looked at that at one time, uh -huh. and uh, it don't work. <laughs> no, no, yeah. You take fracking space. They had this... Uh, <laughs> Atoms for Peace program that Eisenhower basically approved and which they were actually thinking at one time about using nuclear weapons for peaceful purposes is this that they couldn't find any that really were <laughs> practical. Somebody even suggested, I think it was Teller suggested, that well we could even use it for entertainment if we, you know, we could like set off nuclear weapons on the moon and you can stand out at night and watch the bombs go off on the moon. <laughs> 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 wow, what a sight, you know, July the 4th. <laughs> <laughs> How about our two sheet to meter atomic power, though? We got all that out of it. Being so, next military, every once in a while, somebody, uh, particularly those who are uh, in the Greenpeace uh -huh. frame of mind, uh, give me a hard time over the fact that we used atomic bombs on Japan. Uh, if you, we did the numbers on the loss of life if we invaded Japan, opposed to the loss of life if we bombed it. Suffice to say that the number of lives we saved by using the atomic bombs is about 14 or 15 times the loss uh, of, of the, we'd, if we hadn't have used them. We'd have 14 to 15 right. times that many uh, deaths. If you want to get an acrimonious debate going in here today, let's get back in the room. You know, because, uh, you know that, that'll, that'll, that'll occupy us the rest of our time here, you know, because that remains remains controversial. I mean, just look, when, you know, when they tried to put the Enola Gay display up, you know, in the Smithsonian, and uh, you know, the you know the, uh, everything hit the fan there all at once. Uh, yeah, let's go over. Here. Um, I wanted to see about the. You know, they say the dust, whatever they fall in. Fall Radioactive, out. yeah. Yeah, fall out, yeah. Death so, ashes, they called it. Yeah, and now they're saying about, uh, you know, what is it in Russia? The Chernobyl? This plant Chernobyl. Chernobyl and all this oh. gunk that is there forever. So they don't have research about what to do with that or, or what is that. What is that happening? Because then the nuclear energy is still running. So what is that? I don't know. I, I do know that. Uh, you know, pretty soon with all the tests, essentially we all became downwinders. You know, uh, we all became exposed to uh, fission products. Uh, you know, I've heard that those of us who were alive at the time of the atmospheric tests uh, absorbed into our bones 
certain radioactive uh, traces of certain radioactive uh, isotopes, certain uh, nuclides uh, that uh, we absorbed. Uh, all of us did, you know. And in fact, I think, uh, you know, when I think they decided to stop the uh, atmospheric test when uh, I think cesium, uh, radioactive cesium and strontium-90 began to show up in uh, the milk of dairy cows in Wisconsin. Okay, I'm not and making this up. Milk. And uh, they decided, gee, it's not just, uh, you know, little brown people in these islands, it's, uh, it's good Americans, okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's hard to imagine that as long as there's no reverence for the earth, Gaia, right. as our home and our mother, right. and as long as there are genius scientists right. who choose to dedicate their lives to creating machinery and weapons that will destroy hundreds of thousands of people until that transformation happens it's hard to imagine that we won't continue to have competition mm -hmm. to see what kind of weapon can destroy the most people hopefully without any repercussions on us and i mean the united states mm -hmm. the government that funds this, like the drones that are, have killed hundreds and hundreds of civilians, but that is considered a very healthy, productive way to conduct our war now. You know, I think one of the things you said, if I'd like to put my, my own gloss on it like this, is that one thing that was missing 60 years ago, we definitely have now, is a more uh, global, we might say, or environmental or ecological perspective which of course was missing back in those days, it was actually it actually seemed to be thought that these were things that could be controlled, could be localized, that you could set off a multi-megaton blast somewhere and it would just affect that one little area. After the Castle Bravo event and after, you know, these 23 Japanese crewmen made it back home terribly, awfully sick, okay, after radioactive fish was released and some of it consumed in Japan causing a national panic. Needless to say the international press came down hard on the US and the Atomic Energy Commission. Okay, Louis Strauss, who was again head of the Atomic Energy Commission at the time, came out and he says, why this is all being blown out of proportion. Those tests were never out of control. Well, my friends, I have to ask you, you know, the question I have to ask is, when is a 15 megaton blast ever in control? That's yeah. what I have to ask. I mean, you can't control something like that, you know. That, I think, to me, to my mind, I guess that's going to be sort of the theme of my book, the conclusion of my book, is the dangerous illusion of control that people had. They honestly thought that if you were careful enough, and these tests were not haphazard. Let me emphasize that. They were not haphazard. They were planned meticulously. They were planned to an incredible degree, down to the, what was believed the smallest detail, and things still happened that were totally unexpected, okay? Things happened that were totally unexpected. Because we can look in 2020 enough. hindsight and say we should have known but we did okay. Playing, we were playing with things that we didn't know enough. We just didn't know. We didn't know enough, and we still do it today. Like a we, like a bunch of stupid kids with matches, you know. Oh, <laughs> bingo! <laughs> right on the nose. Yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. What was the amount of the lithium deuteride in Castle Bravo? How much of it was there? Yeah. yeah well, the entire nice. device was about twelve tons. Now, um, the problem is with the lithium deuteride is that they had had to enrich it. They enriched it uh, lithium-6 as opposed to lithium-7. They had enriched it, and that's a slow and expensive process. So the next test that they used, called Castle Romeo, uh, they just used natural lithium uh, in the hopes that natural lithium, which is mostly lithium-7 instead of lithium-6, uh, they thought, well, we'll see what it does, and it really went to. It didn't wasn't quite as big as Castle Bravo. It was only about 12 megatons as opposed to 15 megatons, but this basically provided the basis for a system that could be weaponized. So they very quickly weaponized Castle Romeo, and uh, it's kind of weird to me that they would call something like this Romeo, okay? <laughs> I don't know where these names come from, okay? Because they died in you know, it's, <laughs> it's, like, it's also like they call it, you know, Gorgo or Godzilla or something, but anyway, they quickly weaponized it and it became the Mark I thermonuclear bomb, excuse me, the Mark 17 slash 24 thermonuclear bomb, yeah. Well, well, what 
what is the mega tonnage of these uh, missiles that we have on, you know, in the United States in the silo? And uh, if, if someone dropped a, uh, if someone uh, dropped a, uh, a carry and exploded a suitcase bomb in the uh, in the in the uh, uh, over there in the refineries, how far was it reach? God, I have no idea. I have no. It would be. It could be terrifying. Um, Actually, though, um, I just got a book. I haven't read it yet, so I can't tell you what I think about it. By a guy named Mueller, M-U-E-L-L-E-R, called uh, "Atomic Obsession," in which he he is claiming that our fears of uh, terrorists using nuclear devices are these fears are way overblown, and the fear of nuclear proliferation is overblown. So he tries to pour cold water on all that thing. Uh, that's not an area of my research. As I say, I haven't even read his book yet. So I couldn't commentate authoritatively on how much danger uh, could be done. Um, you know, of course, as long as you can fly airplanes in the building and stuff like that, you know, you don't really need nuclear weapons to cause, you know, chaos and havoc and stuff like that. Uh, Most suit, quote, suitcase bombs aren't designed to make a nuclear atomic explosion, only designed to leave it radioactively contaminated until sometime after hell freezes over. <laughs> yeah, you have, a, to me, one of the most interesting developments was the, uh, the, the neutron bomb. And they said, look, it ain't so bad, you know. It just blows up a, a few buildings, mostly it kills people, okay. That's the great advantage of it, is all these neutrons. It just kills lots and lots of people. But, hey, it leaves their buildings intact so that, you know, the next generation won't have the infrastructure destroyed, you know. <laughs> you know, really, when you start getting into it, it really is like you have stepped, when you read this stuff, friends, it's like you have stepped into the movie Doctor Strange Love. I know you remember, you know, uh, the character in there played by George C. Scott, General Buck. Turgidson, okay, love the names in there, General Butt Turgidson, okay, he's got these, uh, you know, there's these books there, it says mega deaths, you know, this sort of thing, you know, like, uh, and he was saying, we have to distinguish between two admittedly regrettable but distinct scenarios, one in which we lose only 20 million tops, <laughs> and the other in which we suffer 200 million. I'm not saying we won't get our hair must. <laughs> you, know, you could talk about 20 million deaths, okay. When these people start talking about these things, it's like you have entered some alternate reality, you know, where people can sit and sane people who get up and put on their clothes and tie their shoes and brush their teeth can sit around talking about Except killing millions of people, you know, overnight, you know, that sort of thing. It's an amazing thing. It really is. It really is like an alternative reality when you get into some of that stuff. It really is. It is, but it isn't, because any of us who read science fiction can separate that part of our brain and yeah. talk about alien invasions and the end of the world. Um, I don't actually make real plans to end the world or what I would do after, but I could talk about it. And maybe what these guys are doing, maybe that they have an amazing ability, which many of us don't have, to sort of compartmentalize, you know, and to, to think about these things in a purely hypothetical way. And, and, and what not. Maybe they have an amazing ability to do that. I don't did know. they express any, did the scientists or any of the soldiers involved express any sort of awareness or remorse for what happened to those people, to to did they to what they released in the world and, and progressing this idea that you know, you know, twenty million people and we can live with that. They, no, some of them couldn't live with it. I mean you have the famous incident uh, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki which, uh, you know, the scientists with the Manhattan Project saw the films, which, you know, some of them were taken, you know, from, uh, you know, the victim, of the victims from Hiroshima and whatnot. For instance, there are things, one that I found particularly revolting was one where uh, the flower pattern of a woman's kimono, the floral pattern, had been burned into her skin, okay? You know, the actual pattern had been, you know, since it was darker, the kimono itself was white, and the flower pattern was darker, and it had been burned into her skin. And, um, you know, um, people that suffered flash burns uh, basically like had their skin hanging from them, that sort of thing. After watching that, Oppenheimer famously said to uh, Truman, I feel like I've got blood on my hands. And Truman basically said, get that crybaby out of here, okay? Truman said, we don't need a crybaby like that hanging around here. 
I guess it was the stirrings of conscience in Oppenheimer and others that ultimately led to his uh, blackmailing, I guess is the only way you can say it, and his ultimate ouster you know, from the Atomic Energy Commission, the fact that he lost yeah. his security clearance at the famous Oppenheimer affair in 1954. Uh, I think you know, the fact that he had, he famously argued too, we don't need hydrogen bombs. Again, Oppenheimer and others said hydrogen bombs, thermonuclear bombs, are too big. What are we going to use them on? They're genocidal weapons, okay? What are we going to use them on? And he says, we can produce atomic bombs of up to half a megaton, up to, you know, 500 kilotons, you know, okay? Um, you, know, uh, you, know, uh, up to, uh, you know, we can use, uh, uh, produce those of half a megaton, and uh, we can produce those of any number we please. That would be sufficient deterrent to anyone, okay? Uh, and I think that was the reason. Others too, Andrei Sakharov, when, uh, he was the one, of course, the leading Russian bomb maker who um, worked on the monster bomb, the Tsar bomb, as they called it. Uh, the Tsar bomb, which, uh, you know, he scaled it down to 50, only 50 megatons because they were afraid of the fallout. And they set it off on the island of Novaya Zemlya up in the uh, Russian Arctic, in the Arctic Ocean. And, um, that bomb was so powerful at 50 megatons that in clear air it could have caused third degree burns uh, 100 kilometers away. It could have caused third degree burns. It was knocking out windows in Finland and Norway 600 miles away. It was knocking out windows, okay? Um, you know, so uh, this scared Sakharov so much that he then became the leading anti-nuclear activist in the Soviet Union at that point. He, you know, moved away from the bombs and became the the leading anti-nuclear activist. Yeah, sorry, I have to walk over to you. I'm deaf, so I have to walk over to <laughs> hear you guys. Why don't you make this the last question, okay? Just so we have enough time to. Really oh, okay. I've been to Hiroshima and all of the monuments that have been possible for people to read the right. account, and uh, so many Americans are not aware that, in addition to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We were firebombing Tokyo, oh, yeah. which caused as many deaths as the atomic bombs, the firebombing of Cologne in Germany. So as horrible as the atomic bombs were, we were committing the same kinds of evil with more traditional weapons that I think many Americans are totally unaware of. Yeah, the evening of March 9th and 10th, 1945, um, you know, General LeMay sent in uh, the B-29 bombers uh, flying at uh, 10,000 feet to drop the incendiary bombs, and uh, that killed over 100,000 and, uh, you know, I think deprived like a million people or more of their homes. It completely burned out a, an area of several square miles, totally burned out. <clears throat> so it's like <clears throat> the moral lines were crossed. I mean sort of interesting to say, well, was there ever a time in which there was a clear line in the sand in which you spare civilians, that sort of thing? I mean, there were various idealistic attempts to do that, but, you know, going back to World War I, there was the Lusitania, okay, in 1915. Exactly 30 years later, in 1945, of course, you had the bombing of Col Dresden, you had the bombing of Tokyo, this sort of thing. So when was the line crossed? That's a very interesting question, if there ever was a line. Sherman's okay. March to the Sea. Was that? Sherman's March to the Sea. Yeah. Could have been. Yeah. Okay. Left everything behind you burn. There, there used, I don't know what still there or not, but there used to be a field grade officer school at Fort Eustis, Virginia. Been there, done that, know a little about it. Uh, and when you are doing plans on a paperwork battle as part of your training, uh, you things that you factor in is acceptable and sustainable losses. You figure how many people are going to, you're going to get killed and how many of yours are going to get killed. Yeah, we still and, have that you know, doctrine today. And, it's and collateral what, what damage. You, what you do to decrease your losses and increase theirs, and they treat people like a bunch of numbers. And if you stop and think about it in the evening before you go to sleep, you don't sleep very well. Killing civilians has always been part of warfare. It was done. The Greeks did it. Alexander the Great did it. The Greek Athens did it. That's right. So that's, just, that's, that's right. So now that we've segued into a discussion of human nature, <laughs> well, I don't know if you had any any closing comments or any final thoughts to Brett. No, that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to avoid a.
a vulgar uh, advertisement for my book or anything. When, when does it come out? <laughs> it's uh, due at the publisher this coming September, and it usually takes them about six months to get it out. Um, sometimes academic presses like Cambridge work a little slow, so I'm expecting sometime by maybe the summer of 2015, something like that. You know, so. You know, we invited you here so we could hear more about it. So thank you for speaking okay, today. Okay.